important role. Uh, the group, perhaps ominously known as FANG, F for Facebook, A for Amazon, N for Netflix, and G, of course, for Google. It's an ever-changing picture, though, and ever more dynamic as broadcasters and OTT platforms try to establish dominance or get a foothold in a new market. Rights holders such as La Liga or governing bodies such as the Spanish Federation or even UEFA launching their own OTT, over-the-top services and platforms. And of course, you've got those tech companies waiting in the wings. They've got those huge pockets, almost endless amounts of resource there, seeing who will blink first, not just testing the market, but maybe even taking the plunge, and that could really be a seismic game changer. But what they're all trying to do, and what they all have in common, is they're trying to engage fans in new and innovative ways that are sustainable and long-term. So let's delve a little bit deeper in this roundtable, entitled The Evolution of Media Broadcasting and Fan Engagement in Football. So please welcome, moderating this session, Mark Chu, Managing Director at Redente Sports, and our speakers, Lars Heidenreich, uh, who is a director at Media Pro Asia, Tom Gainer, head of brand and content at MyKuju, Jason Montero, chief marketing officer at iFlix, and Masaya Weno, who is head of global media business group at Rakuten. Please give them a very warm round of applause. Mark, it's over to you. One, two. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to our my spe panel speakers. I think as we have three yeah. digital yeah. and OTT yeah. platforms yeah. in yeah. Rakuten, yeah. iFlix and MyKuju, and especially with the strong rise in sports digital consumption. I think this panel will be today focusing on the digital consumption of key sports in Asia and Southeast Asia, with respective speakers sharing their thoughts on how to engage the sub subscribers. And I think we'll have a key introduction of our our panel of speakers today. I think first we have Lars, who has been in Asia for over 20 years, and distribution of major properties such as Euros, La Liga, French Open, and tennis. And over the last couple of years, he has been involving, uh, been increased involvement with events in Asia such as Sea Games, the Sina 3-on-3 basketball, and tournaments held in China, Thailand, India, and Australia. And next we have Tom, who is the head of brand and content at Maikoju a live streaming platform focused on football, streaming content from over 120 other countries. Michael Drew is focused on creating the opportunity for everyone in football, no matter what the size, and to be able to share their game. So Tom works out of the headquarters in Amsterdam, joining the scale up in 2018, after spending the five, previous five years in Octagon in London. And next we have Jason. As the group level, he is the iFlix marketing strategy as Chief Marketing Officer, and over, also overall executive responsibility for Malaysia and Indonesia. So Jason has close to 20 years of multinational experience and notable commercial success in the media, mobile and consumer space across Asia Pacific and Middle East. Last but not least, we have Masaya San. Masaya San is responsible for Rakuten Sports, which will be a new OTT platform, which will launch with j -League content, and he will share a little bit more later. He's also responsible for business development and partnership within the media and sports company in the UK and has previously been stationed in Malaysia and Singapore. Thank you, guys. I think in recent years, I think as what has been mentioned previously, there's quite a bit of sports standalone OTT platforms that have been established in Asia, including The Zone, Eleven Sports, Bean Connect, Rugby Pass, and also NBA focusing on their app itself. Some have grown strength in strength, while some have also found it tough penetrating the respective Asian markets. And I think the recent, I think, collapsed Facebook deal in EPL in Vietnam and Thailand has also shown that there's also a lot of strong interest from the key digital players in this market. But I think as we start, we'll do, we have a couple of questions for all our panelists. Let's start with Masaya San. I think maybe you can share a little bit more about Rakuten's entry into the key Asian markets with J-League. Sure. Um, so I, I think you, uh, uh, many of you know that, that we are getting a lot of big name uh, athletes to play in our club. Uh, in J-League, we, we own the uh, Vissel Kobe uh, club, and also we, we have a baseball team, a uh, baseball club uh, as well. But for, for Vissel Kobe, uh, last year we have uh, acquired Andreas Iniesta, 
uh, to play in our club. But at the same time, we have a special contract with him where we have his image rights. Yep. And also we are creating uh, content uh, around him. For the image rights, of course, you know, we can go out and, and get sponsors uh, for Andreas. Uh, but at the same time, we can try to connect the, the sponsorships with the content that, that we create with him. And if you look at his social media followings, he has 80 million followers you know, th throughout the world. And this is a huge thing. Whenever he says, you know, uh, post something, you know, people are definitely going to react. Uh, they always say, you know, how can we watch you play? Where, where can I watch you play in J League? Uh, but at the same time, you also get comments like, please come back to Barcelona uh, as well. <laughs> but, you know, people are, do want to watch him play. They want to see him, you know, what, what he's doing on uh, his off time, but, but also, you know, at him, uh, see him actually play. So... When we heard that the, the rights for J League uh, were open, uh, we, we immediately thought that this would be a great synergy. Uh, so we have uh, just acquired the rights for J League. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we will be starting off with a new uh, uh, sports platform uh, called uh, Rockton Sports. Uh, it will be uh, streamed in over 150 countries uh, throughout the world. Uh, however, we wanted to put a, a stronger emphasis in Asia where, of course, you know, J-League is also trying to uh, penetrate more in the Southeast Asia region. So we are working closely with J-League to see how we can work together uh, to support their initiatives, also at the same time create content and so on uh, as well. And as for, for us, you know, if you look at the overall Southeast Asia market or the Asian market, there, there are still tons of opportunities that, that we can do with sports. So, so this is what we're trying to do going into the future. Thank you, Messiah san I think you have a quite a long queue of people waiting for you outside to talk to you more about content later. I think we'll next go to Jason. Maybe you can share a little bit more about how the Malaysian Super League has been doing on your iFix platform in Southeast Asia, especially you acquired last year, and this is your second year. Maybe what you have done last year and what you have done to increase for this year. Jason. Cool, thank you. So firstly, thank you very much to um, WFS for two things. I think number one, bringing the World Football Summit to KL you know, as a, as a Malaysian is a big deal. So, Selamat Tengah Hari to all my fellow Malaysians out there. And uh, once again, thank you, WFS, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so, firstly, iFlix is a mass entertainment platform. So, we're not a specialized sports platform um, like my Kuju, for example, or specifically like Rakuten going into sports. And we came to a point um, in 2017 where we found that our Malaysian entertainment or content platform was starting to plateau. Um, and in a place where you have 30 million people, it shouldn't be the case with the adoption of smartphones and digital platforms yeah. in the region, in fact, worldwide. And the reason for that is because unlike our other markets in Southeast Asia, we actually found it difficult to acquire local content at mass to put onto our platform. And over the last three years, you know, we're a very data-driven company, so we've learned that actually local content is by far the most efficient content in terms of returns on our platform. And how do we measure efficiency? Um, three ways in terms of following newly acquired customers and what they watch, um, engagement as per the topic of our session, which is how quickly or how, how fast content decays on our platform. Um, and the last one is monetization of content. Yep. So Football Malaysia actually provided us with a platform to actually further explode our numbers where Football Malaysia, it is local content. The beauty about football is it's such a passionate and in Malaysia's number one sport, it also provides repeatability of a returning user. So there are games every single week. So one thing that we did differently with Football Malaysia as well is it's not a classic, I pay you a whole bunch of money, rights for the content. We actually form a very long-term 10-year JV with the league because we believe that, a bit like you, everyone should have the rights to watch football. The yep. games won't be published on free-to-air or on pay TV, so we felt they wanted to liberate that for all Malaysians, and hopefully something we can replicate in other countries. So how has it been doing? It's been amazing. It's been amazing. It's, it's completely transformed our business here in Malaysia because, like I said, you know, being an OTT digital platform, as you can imagine, a lot of our adoption were in the main cities, you know, was in KL, for example. Football actually allowed us to go into the masses and actually take us into every single household beyond just the cities. So it's been transformational. Uh, we're doing a lot more with football, it's not just streaming of games. We do real-time highlights. We're doing a lot more new interactions and graphic overlays on the games itself. So it offers a lot more intimate engagement and also opportunities for brand to actually talk to their customers through football. 
And lastly, we're doing a whole bunch of entertainment productions. So we're doing behind the scenes, we're doing following the footballers' wives, we're doing car collections <laughs> of footballers. So once again, we're an entertainment platform. We're using football to actually bring us into the masses, but our dream is that football is not just for the hardcore fan, it's for everybody. Thank you, Jason. And when we come to Tom, I think a lot of people, especially the football members associations, have worked quite a fair bit with Michael Drew. Maybe to all the other like, distributors and fans, Please tell us more a little bit about Michael Drew and the partnership with the various members associations. Uh, sure. Well, um, I think the first one to mention is uh, uh, a program that we launched with the AFC in yep. 2016, which was a, um, a live streaming developmental program. And that really for us as a business um, can be seen as a bit of a tipping point, taking us from a, from a startup to a, a scale up as we are today. Um, but for those of us that, that haven't heard of Mykuji before, the, the history of the business goes back to 2009. Um, we've got two co-founders, twins in fact, Portuguese twins. We enforce one of them wears a beard at all times so you can tell the difference between both of them. And um, Pedro is a, is a fan of Boa Vista Football Club, a yep. team in Portugal. Uh, they won the league back in 2001. Uh, in 2002, they were playing in the Champions League at Old Trafford, at Anfield, so a, a heritage Portuguese football team. And uh, they then went into uh, decline. They got relegated two years in a row. And in 2009, they found themselves in the third division of the Portuguese League. And Pedro mm -hmm. was, uh, was working abroad at the time, and there was no way for him to watch his team. And actually, even none of the local broadcasters in Portugal bought the rights either. So in 2009, if you supported Boa Vista, unless you were literally in the stadium, you can watch them, which for a team that has hundreds of thousands of followers around the world is a bit of a problem. So that was a light bulb moment for Pedro. Um, and him and his brother, Zhao, then went away and built live streaming technology. <laughs> and they did two things that were very important. They enabled uh, rights holders to be able to stream their content from as simple as a smartphone, literally a mobile phone in your hand, You've got a 16 camera uh, full setup, you can still stream on the platform. But they made it very, very simple and, and adoptable, and that's free for rights holders to use. And then they created the platform, my could you? They created a hub, uh, a home for content. And uh, fast forward to 2015, that was the first time that we had a game on our platform. Uh, they managed to persuade FC Zurich Frauen, the women's football team, to stream with us. Um, and then we slowly started bringing more and more partners on board. And then in 2016, we signed the, the deal with AFC. Um, that brought 37 member associations from Asia onto yep. our platform who still stream with us today. Um, and alongside those member associations, we're also streaming with uh, competitions uh, and clubs across Asia. Um, we've actually got content from 41 of the 47 territories here, um, including the Nadashiko, for example, um, the Piala Indonesia, which has been a, a huge success for us. Um, we've seen over 2 million views on our platform of that content this year alone. Um, so Asia has been a, a massive market for us. We've got an office in Singapore, and we're going to be opening in, in Indonesia and Japan also this year. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about us. Thank you, Tom. I think, last but not least, last, there's a big announcement over the last couple of months with the SEA Games in Manila, and also with your cooperation with Facebook on La Liga in India and South Asia. I think very, can you tell us what are the digital plans for SEA Games and also the cooperation with Facebook, Lars? First of all, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, look, I think from a rights holder perspective, from an agency perspective, as well as a distributor point of view, it's obviously always exciting news when new platforms come to the fold, when uh, regardless of whether it's tech companies, whether it's uh, digital social media, um, are recognizing the great potential of sports, um, not just in football, but across uh, a whole range of different sports, and see the opportunities to engage with their audience, to engage with their subscribers, with their fans, with um, uh, their relevant audience, um, and make a statement by either on a pan-regional basis across Southeast Asia um, or the entire Asian uh, continent, um, come on board and, and, and try to undertake a hopefully sustainable business model. Um, as Media Pro, we've sort of identified a number of partners that we've decided to work with uh, over the last few years. You mentioned Facebook in India for the um, entire um, subcontinent, which was a non-traditional partner in the past, um, but we've managed to sort of combine bringing um, a 
major player on board, offering La Liga to a wider, broader audience um, across India um, on a free basis, um, yet sort of combining with, with one of our previous partners, with Sony Entertainment, um, as a more familiar sort of linear platform. Likewise, now for the Southeast Asia Games in Manila at the end of this year, um, the organizing committee and the Philippines um, Olympic Committee um, have brought out a strong message by saying we want to have the biggest and the best Sea Games ever. We want to have the widest possible audience reach. And our mandate as Media Pro is really help organizers um, try to achieve that uh, ambitious goal. How do we entertain to reach that um, ambition is by obviously working with traditional platforms. That continues to be the case in the future to work and engage with every public free TV network um, to have the biggest national audience in each and every participating country. But over and above that, uh, to also work with social and media platforms um, to reach younger audiences, to reach um, relevant uh, new sports fans, um, whether that's by working with YouTube, whether by working with Twitter, Facebook, um, the Sea Games have uh, introduced um, eSports for the first time ever as a medal sports, as a medal contest, um, where we obviously then also want to engage um, with the relevant platforms where e-gamers traditionally consume their eSports, um, which is on Twitch, whether that may be on the EGG network here in Malaysia. Um, and that for us is a very, very exciting opportunity um, to really work with different partners and bring also the Southeast Asia Games perhaps to the non-traditional homes where um, new audiences also consume the sports in a very, very different way. So my children, for a start, they don't watch 90-minute football matches uh, start to finish anymore. <laughs> they want to see clips. They want to see highlights. They want to see the best goals and the most exciting moments, whether they happen on the pitch or outside of the pitch, where a lot of new stories are being told. And um, if we bring them uh, via different media to these new audiences, I think then we've achieved a lot, both for the rights holders as well as for the media companies who decide to work with us. Thank you, Lars. I think we we'll start with a couple of questions. I think there's some questions that I think we look at as two, one is content and one is monetization. I think we're always thinking that how do we make revenues, right? I think a lot of the OTT platforms is thinking ways to do it. But first, let's go to content. I think we we'll look at We've spoke about four our panel speaking about football. I think that's number one. I think we have all football across everybody. But let's look at it that do you think will the local content or would there be foreign content be actually more key? Because I think it's especially on the OTT front, I think you have two cameras. You can have like maybe Perak fans who may not watch it previously, but they can watch it now. So do you think that would there be a focus more on local or foreign con sports content? Anyone like to answer it? Well, I think you know, we exist for, for local content. Um, we are a platform for, for long-tail football. Um, we, no matter what your size, if you've got five fans or half a million fans, we want to be able to give everybody the opportunity to watch their team. Um, and that's something that, that wasn't previously available before. Um, you know, I think uh, Jason already spoke about the success that they've found of, of local football content. Um, and that's because you're tapping into a very, very loyal tribe of supporters. Um, and it doesn't have to be the biggest team in the world to tap into that passion. Um, it means that you need scale. Yep. Um, we now are streaming content from over 120 countries in the world. Uh, last year, we became the first platform to stream uh, six games from six continents in the same day. And that's now something that happens regularly on our, on our platform. Um, and as I said, we might only have... 200 fans watching one game in Jordan. We might have uh, 2,000 fans watching a, a Nadeshko game in, in Japan. Um, but you're serving content to people who really, really want that content. So I think lo local content is, is, is vitally important. I mean, maybe just to add to this, I mean, from our point of view, we would probably say it's not either or. It could well be both. I think one thing is being recognized that top international quality content, major events, they uh, obviously maintain their relevance. But what you find increasingly so is that here in Asia, obviously you've got an emergence of uh, very, very good football leagues. I mean, whether it's the J League in Japan, China Super League, um, which uh, gathers an audience, not just within their home markets, but uh, increasingly outside uh, international, uh, it's being followed as well. And, and probably hence uh, also Rakuten um, engagement there on, on a pan-regional level. But at the same time, even for an event, 
the example of the French Open, um, it's a major Grand Slam tennis tournament that's being followed uh, regardless of whether you've got a player from your own country. But then, you know, if you've got somebody like Nishikori, then all of a sudden the French Open both presents international and domestic content that is even yet more relevant with Osaka-san and, and Nishikori in Japan, you know, where that used to be uh, uh, followed with all the, the, the top players, um, Australian Open from Korea, um, then I think it's almost becoming a combination of both. Yep. So let me, let me add to that. Um, so we're a company of limited resources because we're still very much VC funded, <laughs> right? So in the world of unlimited resources, I think your answer is correct. It's not one or the other. You've got to have all of it. You've got to have the acquisition to bring in customers and a long tail for those who want to engage you long term. If I had to choose just $1 and where I place my bet on content, it would be local, local, local. Um, and the reason for that is the great irony of, of the journey we went through in the last three years where we started off, if you like, as a Netflix copycat. Right. Um, let's take the business model from the U.S., bring it to Asia, um, and open it up to masters, and we have a business. We were so wrong. We were so wrong. And so the last three years, what we've had to do, uh, and what the luxury of being a data-driven business is, we know real time when we've got it wrong. Mm. And the irony of it all is, local people want to watch local content. So yes, of course, if there is a Japanese player playing the French Open or a Japanese player playing in the EPL and you're a Japanese streaming platform, yes. But then it itself, the reason why people are watching that or are attracted to that is because of the local element. So from our point of view, if we only had limited resources and we had $1 to spend, then it will absolutely be local. We've seen it work for local entertainment content. And my belief is that it's the same thing why we see it working for local sport as well. We must say yeah. Yeah. I, I think Lars was trying to sell me content right now. <laughs> French Open. But, French Open. but <laughs> I, I think for, for us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be... You, 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 you definitely have to have both, I, I think. You know? And uh, no matter which way you go, there, there's no right or wrong. Uh, but for us, we want to be a little bit more uh, of a regional player uh, as well. Uh, J-League, of course, in the end, they, they, they definitely want to uh, compete with the Premier Leagues or, or what so as well. But however, at, at the same time, their focus or, or the, where they are getting the eyeballs is currently in the Southeast Asia region, of course, in, in Japan as well. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, having that, that, that regional presence there, but at the same time, I, I think uh, I agree with you that, you know, local is, is very, very important. You, you, you definitely have to have a platform where you are catering to, to showcase the local, uh, the local sports uh, as well. And you're always going to have, you know, passionate fans yeah. who want to follow that, uh, whatever favorite content. Favorite players. Yeah. Right, right. So, so in that sense, you know, I, I think for us, what we want to do is not only provide, uh, you know, local, regional content, but at the same time also have functions where, where they can, where the viewers can come to our site, uh, get them engaged, uh, to, you know, uh, express their fandom uh, yeah. to their local sports as well. Well, just one more thing to say on this. I think yeah. the word local will kind of continue to evolve a little bit because, yeah. um, you know, we've seen, uh, if you look at uh, Gen Z audiences in, in Europe, 50% of them are supporting a second team. And that second team is not necessarily their local team anymore. Um, the, the Nadeshko on our platform last year was watched uh, in over 60 countries, which neither us nor the Nadesco thought was going to be the case. And that's because we live in a, in a global market now. So you might be in the UK or, or Malaysia, but you can now watch content from wherever it is in the world. So I think local is going to kind of continue to, to evolve. Cool. I think next question we'll go on is monetization. Two kinds, right? One is revenue and one is cost. I think for sports, content costs are slightly a little bit different from entertainment and other genres. So I think basically, I think we'll go to, would there be more and more sports digital platforms joining the fray, especially content rights fees being on a higher side? I think Netflix has officially said that they will not come into sports. I think they briefly mentioned it, you know, as for life rights. What do you think, maybe, Jason, especially, would there be more platforms coming on board? Look, I think what we've seen is you've got to have scale in this business, right? So if you only focus on one particular genre of content or one particular geography, then it's, it's tougher because then your scale is limited. However, you have amazing, um, you know, something like the NBA or EPL. I mean, these, these are amazing, amazing products. And my belief is, you know, 
those particular organizations could be a platform in itself because they can, they can then go, go global. Um, to your point on monetization versus cost, so what's very clear in emerging markets and in Southeast Asia is we see two very clear forms of monetization. Number one is where you liberate the content for everybody and you monetize uh, for brands to speak to them through ad sales, yep. for example, right? Um, and it's not a new thing, right? Because both FTA and pay TV traditions already do that. And second one is for the slightly more affluent customer, if they're annoyed with the ads, then you offer them a path for them to, to subscribe. So yep. that's the very clear forms of monetization. Now the key question is, are those revenue streams or monetization opportunities enough to cover your cost. Yep. And so what we're finding in the digital space is, once again, it's not your traditional um, licensing for the content type model. It's sometimes that plus a hybrid revenue share or a pure revenue share in itself. So our job is to make that mix work, to provide the um, audience for the content providers to have the confidence that there is a path to monetization or rather profitable monetization at the same time liberating content for audiences because the more the content is liberated, the more audiences will actually come onto the platform. And if you believe you can do that by being um, a multi-content platform like ours in multiple geographies, or if you have, my belief is you have s such a powerful content like the EPL, Lola La Liga, m my impression is that you could do it yourself because it's so attractive and essentially you could go global at some point. Me and masaya -san, we can share a little bit more of Rakuten's model for revenue. Maybe you can share sure. a bit. Yeah. Um, so the initial concept for Rakuten Sports uh, came from an existing service set that we already have. Uh, we have the service called uh, Rakuten Viki. Uh, this is a, a, a service that, that is streaming uh, uh, Asian dramas and, and movies. Yeah. Very niche, you know, compared to the Netflix or the Amazons. Uh, however, with this, we, we have a, a reach of over 40 million viewers uh, across the world. But what, what makes Rakt and Vicky very, very uh, unique is the community element. So, you know, Korean dramas, Chinese dramas also in the U.S., you know, we, we are getting a lot of fans. However, compared to the general entertainment side, it, it's such a small, you know, piece of the, the pie. Yeah. But, but we are able to, to uh, get these crowds. But again, this is because of the community ele element. You know, there wasn't a place where fans can, can talk about uh, their, their favorite uh, drama actors or actresses or talk about the f uh, favorite titles uh, or so. But, but we have given you know, not only the content, but also the, the, the engagement uh, features uh, within the site. So for example, people are able to um, uh, time comment uh, on while they are watching dramas. Uh, after they watch the drama, uh, they, they can participate in forums. Uh, they can also subtitle uh, the dramas th that are being seen. Uh, actually, all of the, 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 the content that we have are being subtitled by volunteers. We are not paying them money. <laughs> well, you know. But, but, but by having these engagement features, they're, they're going to stay on Vicky for, for a long time. Uh, and then you, you, can, you can always, uh, you know, uh, monetize this through, through, through advertisement or if we have a special function through a subscription or whatever. But, but so what we thought for sports is, is very similar uh, to the general entertainment or, or this Vicky concept. And I think that, that it, by, by having uh, engagement features, even for, for niche sports or niche leagues or so, I think you, you're definitely going to have a core amount of fans who are going to be engaged on the site. And of course, you can try to monetize uh, through the way that, that we are doing with Vicky as well. I think for last, and I think we talk about being a distributor, I think both of us the same, but I think Jason was mentioning revenue share. How are the actually rights holders are they open with such options? So, you know, I'd just like to hear from you, yeah. That, that's a dirty word for you, right? <laughs> Uh, look, I mean, the realization that sports and sports media rights are not exactly cheap, I mean, yep. that, is, that is not a new discovery. I mean, <laughs> and that has not changed whether it's new tech companies coming to the fold, whether it used to be pay TV when subscription models were introduced. I think it very much depends on the ROP operator and the company in whatever market um, they pursue their business models, how 
they want to monetize and, and, and also really what is the underlying model moving forwards. I mean, when we decided to work with Facebook, um, it was also a revelation for us um, in India to realize, well, there is no pay model for the foreseeable future. That it was an entirely free service, that there was no, let's say, traditional immediate return on investment. And we said, well, why are they doing this? And for them, it was really something to say, well, let's explore a new market. Let's see if football works in a traditional cricket market. But it's also, more than anything else, really gathering data, being able to analyze consumer behavior, being able to, to really understand how a sports fan ticks and, and, and if there is um, a desire uh, to, to do more in that area. And um, I think... Well, if you've got the luxury of a, of a Facebook um, P&L and you can do this, and you know, it's probably no secret that uh, um, the La Liga fees in that particular case didn't break the bank either. Um, but then it is, I think, a useful, hugely useful um, experience for Facebook as well as for La Liga as a rights holder um, to really understand um, the consumer, um, take up the data analysis. So that, I think is a huge uh, understanding in its own right. When you look at how the zone um, in numerous markets around the world these days uh, undertake um, uh, their business models with a strong commitment into sports, with a strong investment in Japan in particular, around both uh, domestic Nothing. and international properties, I think then you really see how new players enter the markets. When you look into the US market, where you've got one of the biggest uh, sports players in the world with ESPN, out of a sudden launching their own OTT services yeah, yeah. Uh, direct to consumer, uh, which breaks any other previous uh, traditional models um, that they had. So I think there's still a lot of trial and error and a lot of, um, you know, checking new business opportunities um, where we haven't got uh, the final answers yet. How about Tom? I mean, you know, I think being involved in the, in the Asian football business over the last three years, what do you think about monetization? I think because you've been doing a lot of production, getting around, but what's the best way of getting back revenue on it? Yeah, I mean, we, we follow quite a, a similar model to Jason, um, working on, on, on advertising and campaign to brands. I think what we're seeing at the, the top of the pyramid is, is a, bit of a, a bit of a rat race. And, and actually for us, um, we're quite happy to let that happen as we go further into the long tail. Um, the future for us is actually um, going further into grassroots football. Um, we are launching a, a solo operator app at the moment, which means that um, football fans, if you're playing seven aside, five aside, uh, you play on your Saturday league team. You can literally set up a phone. Um, we've got machine learning um, being built in at the moment, which means that it will auto pan the football, zoom in and zoom out. Um, so anybody's going to be able to, to film and, and stream their football game. Um, and so that's going to bring a significant amount of, of user-generated content for us and, uh, and huge scale. So, um, yeah, whilst, whilst there's this... Uh, kind of battle going on for, for premium rights at the top and new OTT platforms springing up where uh, we're going the other way. Okay, I think as we lead to the last question today, and I think, I think the next panel is actually on eSports. I think Lars spoke a little bit about the SEA Games being the first time that eSports is a medal sports. I think we have seen it being mentioned very strongly over the past year. Would the traditional sports digital platforms be keen to look at this space? Maybe we'll start with Masaya San first. So uh, we are, uh, we're, we're becoming kind of an old internet company <laughs> now. <laughs> we're, we're still 20 years old, but, but you know, uh, we, we've had a lot of discussions about around esports uh, internally. Um, and, and it's still difficult to find a person <laughs> within the company <laughs> who actually knows, understands the, the space. But for, for us, you know, we, we want to go into any type of contents where, where you know, it, it's not just sitting alone. You know, we, we try to monetize just through one content. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we try to, you know, have, create a synergy or, or you know, create an ecosystem around this uh, uh, the, the, uh, particular content uh, as well. So I, I think we will, you know, definitely see a little bit more, try to, try to look at it a little bit more. But um, I think, you know, but, but if the... Demand is very, very high, of course, and if it, the ROI uh, yes. is also, we, we, we would definitely consider. Yeah. Jason. 
So short answer is yes. yes. Um, so we streamed the Dota Asian Games last year. We're doing MSL in Malaysia right now with the option of doing it in Indonesia. So short answer is yes. Uh, similar to your point, it is... Um, so once again, what we've learned is as long as there's a very strong local element, you've got now big local teams, big local individuals doing really well in the regional space throughout Southeast Asia, but also on the global, on the global scene. So we are in pretty much in every single country in Southeast Asia. So um, competitions that transverse the region um, has actually done, have actually done really well for us, right? So the audience is there. Um, Esports, in a lot of cases, are now outperforming traditional sports from an audience viewing point of, point of view because it's very digitally based, of course, um, and also in terms of potential monetization. So we will continue to do that. Uh, it has to work right in terms of the investment in ROI. But once again, if it draws audiences, if it allows engagement, and there is a fair model of monetization that goes along with it, we definitely will continue to do so. All right, I'll skip Tom. I'll go to Lars. I think in terms of esports for C games, has there what has been any discussion on that? Can you share or no? Well, I mean, obviously, there's still a big debate within the Olympic family. You know, is it going to be an Olympic sports? I don't think it will be an Olympic sport in the foreseeable future. Um, not just yet. It's been a demonstration sport um, within the Asian Games. Um, and, you know, there's going to be, during the Southeast Asia Games, for the first time, a medal award. I think it's a trend um, that will not be stopped. Uh, I think the level of engagement, the, the interactivity element, um, you know, whether it's now also for football leagues, whether it's for, for, for numerous different sports, um, I agree, it's uh, something that's hugely popular across Asia and Southeast Asia in particular, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a global trend, and um, I think it's only just going to be a matter of time that, that eSports becoming bigger and better yet. All right, I think, Tom, why I leave you last is because I have a question, because you really work with a lot of the members' association. Would you be considering doing something really just with football? Maybe not with other games, but maybe just with FIFA or Pro Evolution, but targeting Asia. Is there something that comes to your mind? From an eSports perspective? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we, we've tested with, with eFootball a bit. Um, there isn't necessarily a home for eFootball. Um, I think there's a bit of a challenge in that from a competitive point of view, it just doesn't compete with the kind of Dotas and League of Legends of this of world. Um, so... We have tested with it, um, we will continue to test with it, but I think until the data starts telling us that um, our audience really, really wants it, um, then I'm not sure that we're going to focus all of our efforts on it. Cool. I think, I think that's the end of our panel. I'd like to thank my four speakers. I think there'll be a, a lot of long queues outside, I think for Masaya Sun, for those distributors. For Jason, it's all those local content will be coming after you. And I think for Thomas, a lot of those who is looking for football to, help, to come and help them. And last, I think a lot of prize holders will be coming to see how you can help them. So thank you very much, guys, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.